Working Cows Podcast, episode 332. This episode is brought to you by C90 Ocean Minerals. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. This is Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, recorded exclusively in the C90 Ocean Mineral Studios. And this episode is brought to you by C90. C90 provides complete mineral and trace element nutrition for your soil, pastures, and livestock. This fall, apply C90 to your soil and begin remineralizing and restoring your soil fertility. C90 feeds your soil microbiology so bacteria and fungi can better process natural nitrogen and plant nutrients. Next season, you'll enjoy more productive soil that produces higher quality pastures. Your animals will benefit from protein-packed, nutrient-dense grass that helps improve their vitality. Give our team a call or visit our website at c-90.com. That's www.c-90.com. Call 717-580-1458 and be sure to listen to Working Cows episodes 261, 282, and 312 to learn more. Very excited to share with you today a talk I recently gave at the Montana Farm Bureau District 6 Fall Fest. Uh, It's a second annual event. Uh, Preceding keynote speakers have been Amanda Radke and then myself. So I was really privileged to be in on the ground floor of this new venture that District 6 there in Montana uh, has been doing. This is the eastern side of Montana around Glendive, Sydney, those areas. So really appreciated the opportunity uh, to participate in that and uh, went up there and gave a keynote called What is Your Labor Force? What are the uh, things that we have, the resources that we have to uh, deploy to put them to work for us? So uh, here is my t- talk at the District 6 Montana Farm Bureau Fall Fest. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I really appreciate it. I am a millennial, but I'm not that much of a millennial that I have to hold my phone. I'm just going to use it to advance my slides tonight. So uh, we're going to talk tonight about what is your labor force. And I want to start off by saying that we get the privilege to, re- to work in an incredible industry, whether that's uh, farming, ranching, some combination of the two. And the, one of the things that makes it so unique and incredible is the fact that we get to do it with multiple generations. Proverbs 1631 says, the silver haired head is a crown of glory if it is found in the way of righteousness. And we get the opportunity on a daily basis as agriculturalists to rub the shoulders with previous generations who have been through things before us. And we get to learn from them and we get to uh, uh, glean from their wisdom, and we get to uh, ask them questions and hear from their struggles. And so that's one of the things that really sets this industry apart. Another one is Proverbs twenty twenty nine: the glory of young men is their strength, and the splendor of old men is their gray head. We should value the wisdom that comes from those previous generations, and we should not let it go to waste, and we should do whatever we can to capture their wisdom and learn from them and allow their experiences to help us to survive uh, the the onslaught of things that we can't control, right? What are some of the things we can't control in agriculture? Prices, uh, markets, weather, right? What gets talked about most at the coffee shop? Prices, markets, weather, right? Am I right? So we uh, spend a lot of time talking about things that we can't control, but there are people in our neighborhood or even sitting across from us at the coffee table in the morning, uh, having that first cup of coffee in the morning who we can ask and get uh, information and wisdom from them. So as Deanna said, we're going to talk tonight about the four pillars of a ranching operation, land, animals, money, and people. There's my outline. That's where we're headed. Uh, That's where we're going. Land, animals, money, and and people. And I want to look at it from the perspective of putting those things to work for you. How do you put your land to work for you? How do you put your 
animals to work for you? How do you put your money to work for you? How do you put your people to work for you? When we think about our labor force, a lot of times we probably just think about the people. But there's, there is a, a growing network of understanding of what's going on beneath our feet when it comes to the land. And that's where I'm going to start tonight, talking about the labor force of our land. This is the foundation of an anti-fragile agricultural business. We have lots of words, and I'm hat tip to Nicholas and Nassim Taleb. We have lots of words for things that last a long time. They're durable. They are uh, resilient. But they eventually, those words, they do wear down. They do break. So how do we get past uh, the breaking point and become anti-fragile? And I think that the first thing we need to do is figure out how to enter into a stronger partnership with our land enter into a stronger partnership with the land that is under our feet. And one of the reasons we want to do that is because there are 32,000 tons of atmospheric nitrogen above every acre of Earth's surface. 32,000 tons of atmospheric nitrogen above every acre of Earth's surface. We could take a survey, but I could probably guess what's the most frequently and, and most applied nutrient on farmland in America today. It's got to be, nitrogen's got to be close to the top. Well, if we can become a partner with our land base, if we can become a partner with the soil under our feet on our farms and ranches, it will open itself up to some of that 32,000 tons of atmospheric nitrogen, and we don't have to pay anything for it because it's there. God made the world with a, uh, the air above it being 78% nitrogen. We think we're breathing oxygen. You're actually breathing 78% nitrogen. Uh, when you're breathing. 21% oxygen, and then the rest is fractions of a percent of, of whatever else is in there. So how do we do this? How do we open up the soil? How do we open up the land so that it can take in some of this atmospheric nitrogen? And that's where we get to our employees of the month. Our employees of the month, the dung beetle, the mycorrhiza fungi, and the azo azotobacter bacteria. These guys are your employees of the month. Why? Do, you, do any of you write a check to mycorrhizal fungi ever? Do any of you write a check to azotobacter ever? No. That's the first reason they're your employees of the month, because they work for free. The second reason that they're your employees of the month is because they work for room and board, and they work until they die, and they never take a sick day. Right? Pretty good employee. Yes? You're hearing me. Good employees, right? Work for free, work until they die, Never take a sick day. Pretty awesome employee. If, if I could choose one, I would choose one like that. Well, these guys are out there, and they are available for you uh, to, to go to work for you. And so we want to figure out how to put them to work for us because when we do that, we open up the soil to that 32,000 tons of atmospheric nitrogen. Specifically, the azotobacter is the one that will fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere into your soil, reducing the amount of nitrogen that you have to apply, that you have to go to the uh, co-op and, uh, and buy. No offense to our wonderful sponsors this evening. So, uh, here's a little celebration from my house. This was a, one day early this summer we found some dung beetles. You see, those guys are working. They're just doing what they love to do, rolling poop across the ground. And uh, they will gather that up. They'll roll it off to a place. They'll spread it out. They'll take it down into the soil surface. There's actually three different kinds of dung beetles that we have uh, in, in the world. Uh, there are dwellers, those that dwell in the manure paddies. There are tunnelers, those that tunnel underneath them, and then there are rollers. I had seen a lot of dwellers on our place, but this year was the first year that we saw uh, rollers, and I was pretty excited about it. I was away from home, actually. My wife took a video of it and sent it to me, and we all got really nerdy and celebrated together. So uh, it, was, it was a good time at the Connery house that day. So these guys are they're doing the job of breaking down those manure pads. They're doing the job of spreading it out and taking it down into the soil and making it useful for you. So those guys are awesome. They're uh, one of the employees of the month. Mycorrhiza fungi. These guys, if you've ever been to an aspen forest, like I went to last year on an elk hunt in uh, Colorado, went to an aspen forest. 
dug a hole in the Aspen Forest, and I would have thought that I was in Iowa. That's because that soil is, uh, an Aspen Forest is just a gigantic mycorrhizal fungi network. An aspen forest is just a gigantic mycorrhizal fungi network, and those, those are incredible. Mycorrhizal fungi can dissolve rocks. They can dissolve rocks and pull nutrients out of them and take them to the plant for its use. Uh, underneath our feet is an incredible world, and it's kind of like a black market. They're trading sugar that the, the, the plants take in sunshine, photosynthesize it, turn it into sugar, and shoot it out of their roots. And then all these other critters underground, the mycorrhizal fungi, the azotobacter, uh, there, and, and a, a whole lot of other things going on down there, they are taking those nutrients of sugar and going out into the soil and trading them for the nutrients that the plant needs to grow and be healthy. And let me tell you where this gets really exciting. When I first started the Working Cows podcast journey that I've been on for the last six years, coming up here in the first week of November, it'll be six years ago that I started, they were saying that if you took a, the, the experts were saying that if you take a double handful of soil and hold it in your hands, there are more living organisms in a double handful of soil than there are people on the earth. That's seven and a half billion, right? And getting bigger every day. Well, we are still learning about everything that's going on under the soil. And so now, I just heard just a couple of weeks ago, somebody say, if you take a teaspoon of soil, there are more living organisms in that teaspoon of soil than there are people on the earth. And so if we can figure out how to get into a good relationship with these guys, they all work for free, they all work for room and board, and they all work until they die and they never take a sick day. And the more that we do to give them a good place to work, the more that, that they continue to work uh, for us. And what do they do? They make our, our plants more nutrient-dense. What does that mean? That means that the cow has to eat less to be satisfied and full. And she has to walk uh, less distance to go and rustle her own grub. And so there, this just becomes one of those uh, amazing things where there's more and more and more return on these investments. And so how do we do this? Uh, how do we go from exporting our topsoil? Did you know that America's number one agricultural export is topsoil? This is where most of these microorganisms live is in that top inch or so of topsoil. And we export more of that than we do corn or soybeans or beef or lamb or pork. More topsoil is exported from American agriculture than anything else. And so we're losing all of these great workers that work for free. How do we keep them? How do we hold on to them? What's our employee retention program for these for these uh, employees of the month. It is this, the six principles of soil health. We want to, first of all, consider our context. What has happened on this soil, on this land before? What's been done here before? And how, does, how will that influence my decisions? How will that help me decide what to do next? What to, uh, what to, where to start? Where to start? What does this soil need based on how it's been managed in the past? The next thing is we want to reduce chemical and mechanical disturbance. That's uh, limited tillage, no-till, whatever that looks like on your operation. We want to reduce chemical and mechanical in, uh, disturbance. So there's a lot of fungicide that gets uh, applied in this country. Well, what did we talk about? Mycorrhizal fungi running the uh, underground black market, trading nutrients for sugar in at the, uh, underneath the soil surface and dissolving rocks and bringing nutrients to the, to the plant roots, right? Well, what happens when you, plant, when you spray a fungicide on a mycorrhiza fungi? He becomes less fun. He's not as much of a fun guy as he used to be. So uh, that's one of the things we got to think about. How can we reduce chemical and mechanical disturbance on this land? Diversity is the next principle six, of the six principles of soil health. We want to have uh, as many 
different types of roots as we can. We want tap roots that go down into the soil. We want fibrous roots that break up the compaction, compaction at the soil surface. We want uh, as many different kinds of roots as we can, and we get that by having different types of plants growing uh, as long as we can. And that brings me to the fourth point of uh, the, the six principles of soil health. And that is we want to keep a living root in the soil as long as possible. There are plants that will be photosynthesizing in February because that's just the way they work. And if we can keep as many of them as we can out there throughout the year and uh, keep them there photosynthesizing, they're providing nutrients for those underground microorganisms, and they're continuing to pump that carbon into the soil and help uh, everything that we want to have happen. The fifth principle is livestock integration. We want to integrate livestock onto as many, if not every single acre of agricultural land as we could. I drive through eastern South Dakota and I start to twitch a little bit because there's a lot of fields out there that don't have a fence around them, which tells me there's never going to be a cow out there. And if somebody said, here's your easy button, Clay, that you can change one thing about American agriculture tomorrow, you just push this button and it'll be however you want it to be. This is the one I'd push. Livestock integration on every ag acre of agricultural land in America. That's the one I would push because they're doing so much. They're, uh, they're providing uh, manure and urine and their saliva has stuff in it that the microorganisms like. They're just such an amazing uh, worker and tool and we, we should try to get them on every acre if we can. Last one, armor on the soil. Uh, this would be in the form of uh, litter from last year's growth of uh, plant material. We want to lay it down. Eventually, the soil microorganisms will break that down and incorporate it into the soil itself. And every 1% increase in organic matter equals one more inch of rain that you can hold. Or, I could say it another way, Every 1% increase in organic matter in uh, your soil is an extra 26,000 gallons of water holding capacity in your soil. How many of you had a, a decent spring? Pretty good spring, pretty good summer. Was it okay? Moisture was good? Better than the last two, three years, right? How many of you still saw water run off your place? Right? Me? I did. If you go out and you pay attention to that, that water isn't clear, is it? It's got some milky look to it. It's taking away some of that topsoil with it. And so if we had that armor on the soil, it slows the rain down and it goes into the ground. It really doesn't matter. Let me just say this. It really doesn't matter how much rain you get. What matters is how much you keep. How much do you keep or how much does runs off into the dam or into the neighbors or wherever it's going from your place? How much do you keep is what really matters in the grand scheme of things. So that's pillar number one. If we had a strengthening relationship with our land, we could get these underground microorganisms to work for us. They work for free. They work for room and board. They work until they die, and they never take a sick day. That's pillar number one. Let's take a quick break and hear a word from our sponsor today, C90 Ocean Minerals. C90 provides complete mineral and trace element nutrition for your soil, pastures, and livestock. This fall, apply C90 to your soil and begin remineralizing and restoring your soil fertility. C90 feeds your soil microbiology so bacteria and fungi can better process natural nitrogen and plant nutrients. Next season, you'll enjoy more productive soil that produces higher quality pastures. Your animals will benefit from protein-packed nutrient-dense grass that helps improve their vitality. Give our team a call or visit our website at c-90.com. That's www.c-90.com. Call 717-580-1458 and be sure to listen to Working Cows episodes 261, 282, and 312 to learn more. Pillar number two. I'll probably spend the longest time on pillar number one. Just give you a sense of where we're headed here. Uh, uh, because I'm a nerd and I love uh, microorganisms that I can't see, uh, but, but that people tell me are down there doing amazing things. So uh, that's where I'm at. But the animals, animals, right? 
We all love cows. They're amazing. They do amazing things. They are the power of an anti-fragile agricultural business. If the land is the foundation, the animals are the power. They're the factory. They're the ones that are getting things done for us. And so here's a cow for sale. Look at her features. She's got four-wheel drive. She's got a forage intake manifold. She's got a fertilizer spreader. She's got leather upholstery. She's got an auxiliary horn. You might want to cut those off before you sell her. But uh, she's, got fly, she's got a fly swatter and a replication tra- chamber, right? She's incredible. I mean, she does awesome, awesome work. But here's the thing. I was given a talk to a, a group of FFA students one time, and I had a flip chart up up here, and I gave them all, all sticky, uh, uh, gave them all post-it notes. And I asked them a question. I said, I want you to write down the most stressful day at your ranch. I want you to write down the most stressful day at your ranch and come up here and stick it on this sticky note. Now, we were in western South Dakota, not a lot of harvest going on in western South Dakota. So every one of the most stressful days had to do with working livestock. It had to do with being in the corral with my dad, and he's throwing sorting sticks at me, and he's yelling at me, right? Anybody ever, ever, ever been yelled at in a corral, right? <laughs> Anybody ever done some yelling in a corral, huh? Yeah, come on. You didn't raise your hand. I know, you're lying. No. Here's the problem. They're a source of stress. Sometimes they can be a source of stress. But there's a way. Again, there's a way. If we're willing to think differently, if we're willing to educate ourselves and open ourselves up to new ways of thinking and operating, there's a way to interact with our animals in a less stress-free way. Here's the most, one of the most mind-blowing things I've heard in the six years I've been doing the Working Cows podcast is when Tom Knopfsinger, Dr. Tom Knopfsinger from Nebraska, told me that they have, they have verified that through low-stress stockmanship, it is possible to have calves gain weight on weaning day. Weaning day is one of those days that ended up on that that, uh, flip chart of one of the most stressful days at our ranch. And if it's stressful for you, it's stressful for the cattle. I promise you that. And stressed cattle don't don't gain weight, right? The higher their head gets, the less weight they're gaining or the more weight they're losing right? So the lower their head gets, if you can keep their head low, uh, they're gaining weight. They're doing a better job of gaining weight in any case. And so Tom Knopfsinger, Dr. Tom Knopfsinger, very much into the data, very much into the verified uh, uh, peer-reviewed studies, says we've got, we've got verified uh, data that says these calves gained weight on weaning day. If, it's, if somebody's doing it, it's probably possible, Right? We just have to think a little differently about how we're going to approach this day. There you go. I think I'm done on the animals. Land, animals, money, people. If you want to remember the acronym, LAMP, L-A-M-P. Land, animals, money, and people. And we want to put them to work for us. We want to put the animals to work for us. We want them to be uh, operating in a, in a stress-free environment so that they can go out and and eat and rustle up their own grub and do all the things that they were designed to do. And we want to put our land to work for us, and we want to put our money to work for us. How do we put our money to work for us? Well, this is a a good year as far as the markets are concerned, right? This is a good year as far as the markets are concerned, better than it's been in recent memory. So Dave Pratt says this. He said, Knowing how to grow crops and raise livestock is not the same thing as knowing how to run a business that raises crops and grows livestock. You see, we all love the lifestyle that we get to live. And a lot of times we're willing to do it for a low return because we love the lifestyle so much. I mean, we get to work with cows and horses and dogs every day, right? I didn't mention people. <laughs> I didn't say people, right? <laughs> How many of you got into agriculture because you love working with people, right? We're going to get there. Just a second. Land, animals, money, people. We're on money right now. But we, get, we, will, we will do what we do for a low return because of the great lifestyle that we get to live. And I think that we should be willing to examine the returns that we're getting. And when we get a good return, like this year is probably shaping up to be for a lot of us, when we get a good return, we should look at the opportunities that it presents opportunities to diversify, 
so that we can, can so that we aren't uh, so subject to the highs and lows of the market. Diversify the operation. I don't know if that's agritourism. I don't know if that's another species. I don't know if that's another farm enterprise. I don't know what that is for you. I'm uh, again, like Tiana said, I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'm just here to give you something to think about, right? So uh, we want to diversify. Add another income stream to ensure more stability. This might be the year to think about doing that. Educate yourself. Sharpen the management acts. Get more out of your effort by going to a stockmanship school or a, a soil health academy or a grazing school or go educate yourself. Have a continuing education program for every employee on your ranch to go out and to be more educated about what it is we're managing. Most of us, many of us, in this room manage uh, businesses with multi-million dollar asset line items. And we have an an immense amount of resources as far as the assets that we manage. And we should take it as though it were a business and we should educate ourselves so that we can do it at a higher level. Maybe this is the t- opportunity to expand by the, by the neighboring place or uh, bring in more livestock or bring back another member of the family. All of this has to be uh, weighed and measured very seriously. It's nothing to enter into lightly or prematurely. If the business is ready, though, this might be the opportunity to do it. And finally, maybe it's time to update. Sometimes antiquated equipment is the reason for the stress. Sometimes our stress is because the, uh, the facilities that we have are not uh, properly functioning to allow low-stress livestock handling to happen. Sometimes the uh, equipment that we have, it doesn't stay running and it becomes a stress. And maybe this is the opportunity. But let me tell you one thing I heard one time in a, in a ranching ed, uh, continuing education seminar for ranching. A while before I took the class, the largest caterpillar dealer in Wyoming. Now, think about that. He's got to be pretty close to one of the largest caterpillar dealers in the world if he's the largest caterpillar dealer in Wyoming. I'm talking about the yellow tractors, right? Right, not the fuzzy little critters. Uh, Largest caterpillar dealer in Wyoming. The owner of that dealership said, I learned a long time ago in business, if it's not a good business decision, it's not a good tax decision. When we get... uh, extra income, a lot of times we default to buying something new to offset the taxes. And there's a lot of other things that we could do with that money, and I think that we should think about that sometimes in years like this. I think we're on to people. Now the people, the focus. The land is the foundation. The animals are the power. I neglected to say the money is the leverage. It's the lever. The farther you get out on the end of it, the more power that lever gets, and you get to push You get to move a bigger rock with that lever. The people are the focus. The people are the focus. It's all about the people. Just think about this. When you start to think about how many people do you interact with on your business? Well, the four or five that are sitting around the supper table. No, but there's the guy that... There's the guy that you buy hay from. There's the guy that hauls your hay. There's the guy that brings your fuel. There's... Just start thinking about it in those terms. It's still a people business. We still deal with people. And if we can strengthen relationships with people, just like we strengthen relationships with land, it gives us a return on that investment. We strengthen relationships with animals, it gives us a return on that investment. We strengthen relationships with money, it gives us a return on that investment. And there, you could could have the greatest year, financially speaking, in the history of the world, but if you have strife in the people side of your business, it could still be the most miserable year of your career. And so we want to make sure that we are doing what we can to strengthen our relationship with the people. All the way back on episode two of the Working Cows podcast, Dallas Mount was the instructor of the continuing education seminar I was talking about. I took back in, uh, back in, uh, my wife and I took back in 2017. And I asked Dallas, we talked about these four pillars on that episode, episode two. And I asked Dallas, I said, of all of these pillars, which one provides the greatest barrier to success 
in agricultural businesses in your experience? And he was 25 years as an extension agent before he took over uh, the ranch management consultants as the company that puts on the ranching for profit school. He was 25 years as an extension agent. He sat across from a lot of people at their kitchen table and, and worked with them through the numbers, worked with them through the stockmanship and the land management and the people management. And I asked him, what's the greatest barrier to success for agricultural businesses as, uh, according to your experience? And this is what he said, without a doubt, it's the people. Without a doubt, it's the people. More, we, we will gut it out through a, a blizzard. We will gut it out through low prices. We will gut it out through a drought. But ultimately, what is it that will contribute most assuredly to the failure of your agricultural business? It's, it is difficult relationships with people. That's going to be the issue more often than not. So here's one way to think about it. Jared Nock, he uh, works for a company uh, called Mil Milborn Seeds out of South Dakota, and I saw him say this in a presentation one time. He showed a picture of a beautiful hip roof barn, a uh, beautiful red barn, should be on a postcard somewhere, and he said, this is my ranch, or this is my farm, but then he said, this is my legacy, and this is a beautiful picture that my wife took of uh, a sunset at our, at our ranch near Mud Butte, South Dakota, and this is my ranch, it's got a lot of land, a lot of memories. It's got a lot of years, and there's pressure that comes with it, not losing this. Uh, and, and we've only just been there a few years, so the, the, those of you that have been there four, five, six generations, that pressure is even higher. But ultimately, that's your legacy, the people. That's my family right there. Uh, my son, Braden, on the left, my daughter, Charlie, in the front, my son Glover in the front there, and then my son Calvin and my beautiful wife Miranda uh, is there as well. And time is short. Time is short for us. We have to invest wisely. Sometimes we have to leave things undone to make sure that we take care of people. And let me tell you this, I, will, I promise you, I promise you this, it's never too late for a fresh start. Never too late for you to, to sit down and have a hard conversation with the people in your business, in your family, where there's friction. Now, you might have to eat some crow. I'll just share with you the lesson that my good friend Wally Olson shared with me. If you're going to eat crow, make sure you swallow it head first because the feathers get stuck going down the other way. So uh, you might have to eat some crow. You might have to ask for forgiveness. But you know what? Lamentations 3.23 says, By the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. His mercies are new every morning. Every day is a new chance to start over, to have a fresh start with the family, with the in-laws, with the outlaws, right? It, every day is another opportunity, right? Here's the unique thing about, about ranches. We talk about all our relationships that are city cousins have. They have relationships with friends and family and neighbors and relatives and enemies and co-workers. Well, sometimes the people on your ranch are all six of those. They're neighbors, they're friends, they're relatives, they're enemies, they're co-workers. Sometimes that's true, right? But it's never too late for a fresh start. We can always start over. Elaine Fraze is a, has become a good friend of mine through the podcast, and she has this saying, she says, clarity is kindness. Clarity is kindness. What are the things that we need to give clarity on? We need to give clarity on the mission of our organizations. Why are we here? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing the things that we're doing? What is the target we're shooting at? Uh, Stan Parsons was the guy who started Ranch Management Consultants back in the 80s. Him and Alan Savory came to America together. And Stan Parsons was famous for saying this. He said, in American agriculture, we hit bullseyes all the time. The problem is sometimes we're aiming at the wrong target. And so we want to aim at the right target. And we want to give everybody the same target and say, this is why we exist. This is what this family business is here to do. This is our mission. And we need to give them clarity on vision. What's vision? Mission is what we're doing, the target we're shooting at. Vision is how are we going to get there? What's the next three to five years look like to hit that target 
of that mission. And we need to sit down and come up with our mission and vision. We need to give people organizational clarity. They need to know who's responsible for what. And when it doesn't get done, there's going to be accountability and we know exactly who will be accountable for it. Right? We need to give organizational clarity. You've heard the, the, the phrase, right? Too many chefs in the kitchen. We, we need to give organizational clarity to our businesses. And the last one is we need to give successional clarity. Clar- this is what Elaine's talking about. Transitional clarity. How are we going to get this business from the fourth generation to the fifth generation? How are we going to get this business from the second generation to the third generation? How are we going to get this business from the fifth generation to the sixth generation? And there are a few people in the world I would recommend more highly than Elaine Frey's to help your family have that conversation. If you want later, I can give you her contact information and get you in touch with her. Uh, Farmfamilycoach.com is her website, but she is excellent and I, I count her a friend. And I would encourage you to take the time to get clarity on all these things. What are we here for? What are we doing? How are we going to get there? Who's responsible for what? And what happens when the leading generation is no longer leading? This is what I'm going to leave you with. Clarity is kindness. Get clarity on why you're doing what you're doing, how you're going to hit the target that you're aiming at, who's responsible for what, and how you're going to get this business from this generation to the next generation. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an honor. Shout out to the uh, Montana Farm Bureau District 6 Fall Fest Planning Committee. Uh, Very much appreciate them uh, inviting me to come out and share and speak and really appreciated the opportunity. Uh, Really looking forward to next week on the Working Cows podcast. Dallas Mount and I are going to take a deep dive on executive link the executive link program from ranch management consultants and really what this is is a pro- a proxy to rehash the conversation on what do we do with the income that we're going to experience in higher market conditions like many people are experiencing now and towards the end of that conversation i really appreciate uh, the tone that dallas brings to it to say you know what we recognize not everybody is getting in on this opportunity uh, but if you are it's presenting an opportunity to do that, and Executive Link is a great tool to help us make good business decisions uh, for our agricultural businesses. So uh, really appreciate uh, him coming back on. I'm really looking forward to sharing that episode with you coming your way again real soon on another episode of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.